This is not only the day that the Lord hath made, but it is the night that the Lord hath made. Not only is it the night that the Lord hath made, it is the hour and the very moment that the Lord has made. And we rejoice and we are glad in it. I am eternally glad and grateful to your wonderful pastor, the Reverend Sherman Fort, for extending to me the invitation to come and to be a part of this revival experience. I have, in the words of the Apostle Paul, longed to be with you. It's not so much that I did not want to come, but on the dates that he gave me, I was not able to come. So I'm happy tonight that we were able to work out a date. And he has been more than kind and flattering in his brief words of introduction. Uh, sometimes African-American preachers can be guilty of hyperbole. And all of the wonderful things, all of the superlative things that he has said about me are not necessarily true, but they remind me of a story that I heard Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. tell when I heard him doing my undergraduate years at Howard University. He stood up one night, the crowd was so great that Crampton Auditorium could not hold it and the crowd had to be taken. I remember it so clearly on a rainy night, a Thursday night, there in the district we had to go to the gymnasium and our president, Dr. James Madison Nabrit Jr., who argued Brown versus the Board of Education with Thurgood Marshall presented Dr. King, and he presented Dr. King with all of these buoyant words, and Dr. King told a story about a woman who had never been married, and how he had gone to the place of her employment, and the employer said, Annie, I understand that you're getting married. She said, no, I'm not getting married, but thank God for the rumor. So all the things that he has said about me are not necessarily true, but thank God for the rumor. I am so honored tonight to be associated with Dr. Frederick D. Haynes III of the Friendship West Baptist Church in Dallas. <laughs> Certainly one of the clear and clarion voices in this generation, and we thank God for him and the tremendous impact that he is making on ministry and as he addresses the issues that are so critical to our current time. So many familiar faces. I'm glad to see Dr. Warren Student, Stewart and his lovely lady who are here tonight, and the brothers Pleasant, Welton and Milton. It's a joy. Dr. Patrick Walker is here from the West Coast. We need somebody here from the East. Amen. And I'm glad to see Dr. Helen Hunter who is here tonight and a student of mine from Trinity Lutheran Seminary in Columbus. So many other wonderful things that I would love to say, but time is of the essence because there is one coming after me, mightier than I. And I can hear him on that track, coming down that track, and I want to get off that track as soon as I can. Open your Bibles, if you will, tonight to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. And I want to read in your hearing tonight from the New International Version, Mark, chapter 6. Now, I want to begin reading at the 17th verse, but I want to rivet my attention, God willing, on that 20th verse. The 6th chapter of Mark, beginning at verse 17, scripted tonight in the New International Translation. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested and had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. And I come to the text. 
When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. You may return to your seated places. Glad to see Dr. David Wade, who is here as well. I want to speak briefly tonight in the time that is mine about risky business. Risky business. When I think about the wonderful theme that you have chosen for this revival, the whole idea of shift, making the transformation from conversation to conduct, I'm led to think about how much life is very much about shifting. Anybody who claims Christian growth in discipleship is someone who can never talk about stagnation and one ought not live in regression, but we always look forward because living in Christ is nothing short of an adventure. It is a journey, it is a sojourn, and we are called upon, because we follow him, to take certain risk. Nobody can talk about any kind of shift without moving from one position to another. And if there's anything that can be said tragically about so many people in the life of the church today who have remained pretty much solidified in how they think, solidified in how they speak, and ultimately solidified in how they act, it is all because these are people who nine times out of ten are not willing to take a risk. If I were to ask you tonight to define risk, how would you do it? Let me take a stab at it. Risk, I think, is the intentional interaction that one has with uncertainty. The intentional interaction that one has with uncertainty. Whenever someone cast his or her lot with Jesus Christ, it is uncertain as to what the future really holds. We have an idea of what Christian discipleship is all about. We talk about him leading us in paths of righteousness for his namesake, in green pastures, by still waters. But what we really don't grasp is that sometimes when God leads us in those places, they are sometimes by a very rough route. Risk and faith, in my opinion, are semantical twins. If risk is the intentional interaction that I have with uncertainty, and if the writer of Hebrews defines faith as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things I cannot see, then my only option in following Christ is to trust him when I cannot trace him. And anybody tonight who thinks that he or she can trace Christ is not being absolutely honest. He leads us over mountains we don't want to cross. He demands that we go through valleys that are dark and dangerous through which we do not want to go. And more often than not, he makes us say things by way of repentance and forgiveness that we really don't want to say. Nobody can really talk about shift going from conversation to conduct, moving from that which you articulate to that which you honestly do without taking a risk. One of the greatest books that I've ever read in my experience is Dietrich Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Discipleship. And in that book written at the height of terror in Nazi Germany, Bonhoeffer says that whenever Christ calls a man, whenever Christ calls a woman, he calls that man or that woman to come and die. Self must perish. In the mind of Christ, as Paul writes to the church at Philippi, must be installed 
employed and used by the man or woman who claims to make that shift. When Martin Luther tacked his theses on the door of the church at Wittenberg, challenging not only the Roman Catholic Pope, but the very traditions of Catholic hierarchy, he said that no one can ever go against the grain of conscience. And whoever goes against the grain of conscience sacrifices what is right. And at the end of that statement, he says that I cannot change my mind. I must do what my conscience dictates. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. I would hope that your theme is more than a topic. It carries with it semantical excellence shift from conversation to conduct. But anybody who's going to make a serious shift this week is going to take a risk. You are going to wrestle with uncertainty. And God is going to make you do something you really don't want to do. And God is going to make you go places you don't want to go and say things that you don't want to say. I don't take my cue tonight from a theological textbook. I'm not here to talk about what I've read in some chronicle, but I lift the timeless word of God. I wish I had a shout on the word of God. Now, just a moment ago, you shouted on the praise song. Let's shout on the word. The last time I read, the word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. In fact, one writer says that thy word is like fire, shut up in my bones. I know it's dark, but there ought to be some light in here. Chilly outside, but there ought to be some heat in here. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Nobody in this room who has been in the church for any significant period of time is unfamiliar with the name of John the Baptist, son of Zechariah the priest and his wife Elizabeth. John and Jesus are drawn together by biology. Their mothers were first cousin, which makes them second cousins. In fact, when Mary travels from Nazareth to the hill country of Ephraim, with the news that she is pregnant and not married. The moment that she enters the room and greets Elizabeth, John, who is gestating in the womb of Elizabeth, has prenatal perception. And she's able to glance from her womb, or Elizabeth's womb, into the womb of Mary. And the Bible says that when John sees Jesus in Mary's womb, he leaps. And there ought to be a leap tonight when we think about how good God has been. If you're talking about a shift, you ought to see what's on the horizon. That it's not necessarily something that you can put your hand on right now, but it ought to be something that you see coming to pass. Don't know when, don't know how long, but it is coming to pass. John does something that is risky. He has an intentional interaction with uncertainty when he dares to challenge the fact that Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee has stolen the wife of his brother, Herod the Tetrarch of Iturera, and he refuses to be silent about it. Nobody can be silent about an authentic shift. A shift is not something that you keep to yourself. A shift cannot be silenced, but a shift ultimately must be visible. Notice what John does not do. John does not tweet what he thinks about Herod. He does not text what he thinks about Herod. He does not put on Instagram what he thinks about Herod, but he stands outside of the palace. And with voluminous vocality, 
he shouts up at Herod and says, that woman you're sleeping with every night is really not your wife. The ink is not even dry on the divorce papers. And everybody knows that you have gone to Iturera and you have stolen your brother's wife. That's risky for a hill preacher to raise hell with the monarch who is in charge of Galilee. But he has no fear. And he has no trepidation. And the reason why I love John is because John is not like many men and women who occupy the pulpits today. They are chumps. And dare I say it tonight, one of our problems today when it comes to the impotence of the Christian pulpit is that we have too many punks in the pulpit. Men and women who will not tell the truth. And these are critical and crucial times. And you and I are called upon not to preach what people want to hear. But preach what people need to hear. The last time I read the record, the record says that the truth will make you free. John creates antagonists. He risked not only his reputation, but he literally risked his life. Don't talk to me about making a shift if you're not ready for antagonists. For there are certain things that you must endure if, in fact, a shift is going to take place. The first thing that I'm going to suggest to you in this lecture is this. That anybody who's making a shift from conversation to conduct must be braced for making enemies. Now notice that I, not, I did not speak in the singular. But I'm speaking in the plural, plural. You will make enemies the minute you take a shift in the direction of doing what Jesus Christ says. Has anybody already discovered that? Has anybody discovered what I've discovered? That the more you follow Christ and the closer you get to him, the more hell comes up in your life. The more relationships become temperamental and some of them are destroyed because anybody who tells the truth must expose the elephant in the room. And whenever you expose the elephant in the room, you, in the language of our elders, step on the toe of somebody else. Preachers create, Dr. Stewart, what I call congregational, communal, and societal schizophrenia. Not all preachers. But those who preach the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ create schizophrenia among the people to whom they preach. What do you mean? A schizophrenic personality is a double-minded personality. Somebody whose mentality travels on two different levels. People love us when we preach what they want to hear. People fall in love with us, Dr. Thwart when we tickle their ears. But the minute you expose the elephant in their room and talk about the crooked way in them that must be made straight and the rough place in them that must be made plain, they go from loving you to hating you, from liking you to disliking you. In any pastor or preacher, who makes the claim that all people love him or her is a liar and the truth ain't in you. If everybody likes you, I question whether or not you are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because whenever you expose the elephant in the room, all hell breaks loose. 
every January the 15th, we pull Martin Luther King Jr. out of mothball and celebrate his life and his legacy. And I blame the church for allowing the society to condescend him to the level of civil rights leader. He was first and foremost a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was preacher, he was pastor, and thank God he was prophet. If Bonhoeffer is right and God calls us to die, then he calls us to do more than deal in priestly responsibilities. Any preacher can serve communion. Any preacher can go in the water and baptize. Any preacher can visit the sick. Any preacher can bury the dead. Any preacher can marry the young. Any preacher can hold a baby in his or her arms and pray for the life of that child. But there's a difference between being a priest and a prophet. Priestly functions don't offend people because there's very little shift. Y'all miss that. But when you move from priest to prophet, and you tell what is the elephant in the room, all hell breaks loose. Everybody loved Martin Luther King when they loved to talk about how he had an undergraduate degree from Morehouse and a theological degree from Croza and how he studied at the feet of L. Harold DeWolf in systematic theology and got a Ph.D. in systematic theology from Boston University. But when he packed up his bag, Married Coretta and moved to Montgomery. It was all right as long as he talked polite Bible stories. When he dug nuggets of truth out of a narrative. But when he made the word flesh. When that word took on incarnational reality. And he placed the gospel in places like Montgomery and Birmingham and Selma and the Cicero section of Chicago. And then had the unmitigated gall to part his black lips and come against Vietnam. He created societal schizophrenia. Everybody loved to talk about his elocutionary excellence. His oratorical splendor. How he could make subject and verb agree so wonderfully. How he knew where to place adjectives in their right place. They, place. they loved his oratorical excellence. But when he put the reality of the elephant in the room, it was risky business. Condoleezza Wright, Secretary of State under George Bush, highly questionable, <laughs> said these words. She said that racism is the original birth defect of the United States. In 1787, when the founding fathers gathered around a table in Philadelphia, to draw up that document that we call the Constitution, second only to the Declaration of Independence. There was a caricature, Dr. Haynes, of under that table a snake <laughs> whirling around with a venomous tongue coming out of his mouth. And Benjamin Franklin said, we must deal with the snake under the table. Because if we don't deal with the snake, snake under the table, in the years to come, it will rise up to haunt us. And Martin King, and men like Henry Highland Garnett, Nathaniel Paul, and women like Jerena Lee and Phyllis Wheatley and Harriet Tubman, and people like Adam Clayton Powell Sr. and Adam Clayton Powell Jr., 
And people like William Augustus Jones Jr. And in our own generation, Jeremiah Wright and Frederick Douglass Haynes. Whenever these voices are raised to deal with the elephant in the room, there's always that word that comes back to tell us, leave it alone. May I say something and pray that you don't get offended? And if you do, you will get over it. Nobody over the last eight years has risked talking about the underclass. See what I mean? A whole lot of you Negroes think you middle class. You're just two paychecks from eviction. Stop paying that car note on that BMW or that Lexus and they will reproduce that car. Nobody talks about the underclass. Obama has not talked about it in eight years. Jesus didn't talk about middle class. Jesus said, I was hungry. Come on, I want to preach a little while. And you didn't feed me. Thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. Naked. You did not clothe me ignorant. You did not educate me. I was sick. You came not to see about me. I was in jail. You did not visit me in as much as you have done it. Unto one of the least of these, you have done it unto me. We have been so captivated by Adam Smith's wealth of nations and by Ronald Reagan's trickle-down economics that we have lost sight of the underclass. Now you black people can sit up here in Mesa, Arizona, and act like you middle class all you want. But if you're like me, you came from the hood. <laughs> come on, may I preach a little while. In fact, I didn't come from the hood. I came from the neighborhood. But things are so bad now, the neighbors are gone. And all we got left is the hood. Martin King is dead tonight. Not because he was just a preacher. He's dead because he dealt with the elephant in the room. In 1987, when the nation celebrated the sesquicentennial of the Constitution. And Thurgood Marshall was head of the Commission of Celebration. I waited for somebody to deal with the elephant in the room. Nobody did it. Justice Marshall didn't do it. Not one voice on the highest tribunal in our republic dealt with it. And to what am I referring? Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution says that people who look like you and me are three-fifths of a human being. I know what the 14th Amendment says to the Constitution that grants us citizenship. But nobody challenged that second article or that second section of that first article that says, I'm three-fifths of a human being. Go to the archives down the street from Howard University on George Avenue in Washington. And it's still there in the document. Three-fifths of a human being. That's why we have a Donald Trump. That's why we have a Ted Cruz. That's why we have a Marco Rubio. Because they think we are three-fifths of a human being. Somebody ought to remind them about the glorious words of our republic. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights and among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
risky business when you start talking about the elephant in the room. I'm so glad, Freddie, that Trump and nobody else in the Republican Party was at the border on a particular day when a man named Joseph and his wife Mary came with a little baby named Jesus. Immigrants from Nazareth trying to come into Egypt as refugees. I'm glad they went on the immigration committee. I'm lecturing. Martin Nimoyla was also a powerful voice during the Second Reich, Third Reich. He said, first Hitler came for the socialists, but I said nothing because I was not a socialist. Then he came for the trade unionists. But I said nothing because I was not a trade unionist. Then he came back a third time for the Jew. But I said nothing, Dr. Walker, because I was not a Jew. Then when he came back the fourth time for me, there was nobody left. <laughs> you missed it. First Trump came for the Muslims. By declaring that he doesn't want them here. Then he said he's going to shut the doors to the borders and disallow immigrants. Who's he coming for next? And you got crazy African Americans who are going out and listening to that garbage that he's preaching. It takes a risky preacher to stand up and declare. You know what the problem with many of us is? The problem with many of us is that when we make the shift, we want to stay confident and convenient in the lifestyle that we enjoy. Can I be brutally honest tonight? Underscore that word brutally. One of the most despicable people I think today in America is a black man by the name of Michael Jordan. Despicable. I believe the greatest tennis or basketball player ever to put his tennis shoes on a court. But I remember, I'm like an elephant, I got a long memory. I remember when they put Harvey Gant, then the mayor of Charlotte, to run against Jesse Helms, who held the Senate seat in North Carolina. And they wanted, the Democratic Party of North Carolina wanted Michael Jordan to contribute. And he said, I can't do it because it will disturb my comfort and my convenience because white Republicans Buy my tennis shoes too. To whom much is given. Come on, I need my crowd. No, no, I need somebody who was here before the millennials showed up. How many of you were raised in my generation when you were taught be a credit to the race? That it just is not about you and what you are going to amass, but you got to help somebody. Come on, give me five seconds of preaching up in here. If I can help somebody as I pass along, cheer somebody with a word of song, show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living, I wish I had a hallelujah church. If I can do my duty as a Christian or bring salvation to a world once wrought, spread the message like the master taught, then my living will not be in vain. He did something else. 
The African-American students wrote him and said, you are a graduate and alumnus of our school, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. We, the African-American students, want to build an alcove, a reading slash fellowship room onto the student union on the campus of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and he said, no, an alcove, a fellowship room. All he was concerned about was comfort and convenience. But this gospel coming out of this book is a gospel that will make you take risk. Risk that will force your comfort and convenience. Does anybody here believe God still will take care of you? That even if they put you out of your pulpit, God will still take care of you. Can I go back to that old hymn that says, Be not dismayed. Whatever be time, God will. Not God might. God will. Not there's a possibility. But God will take care of you. Lean. Weary one. Let me get out of here. Whenever you shift, I'm trying to wed myself to your theme, from conversation to conduct, that is not to suggest that there won't be moments of fear. If risk is the intentional interaction with uncertainty, sometimes when the uncertain occurs in my life. I raise questions about God. Now don't you think you're so holy that you never question God? Everybody questions God sometimes. He'll lead you into places you don't want to go and make you say things you don't want to say. I know what Paul told Timothy. God had not given us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of love, spirit of power, sound mind. I know what God told John to write. Perfect love casteth out all fear, but, but every now and then, I'm like James Brown. I break out in a cold sweat. Can anybody give somebody a high five and say, been there, done that? My back has gotten up against a wall. I've been between a rock and a hard place. And when you break out in a cold sweat, that nasty taste comes up in your mouth. And your brow saturates itself with perspiration. John, the one who had stood waist deep in the Jordan River, saw Jesus coming to be baptized. John, the one who said, I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the latchet on your shoes. John, who had heard the voice of God coming from heaven, dancing up and down the Jordan Valley. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John, who saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove in the waters. John got locked up in prison because the man who liked to listen to him preach bent his ear more towards his hellish wife than the son of the living God, is locked up, now in jail, in prison on the banks of the Dead Sea in the castle of Meheris. And his doubt and his fear push him to send his disciples. Find my second cousin. And when you find him, raise one interrogative. Are you the one? Or do we look for somebody else? Now notice that Jesus had not visited John before, and now he still doesn't visit him. But John gets these words. And whenever risky business gets you in trouble, Whenever you catch hell for making your shift, 
Remind yourself of the words of Jesus. Tell John and everybody else who makes the shift that you may not see me in the flesh, but just remember these things. The blind are still seeing. The lame are throwing away their crutches. The deaf are hearing. The lepers are cleansed. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. Somebody needs to know tonight before the shift is made that you may not have a lot of money and God may take away from you your comfort and convenience. But oh, hallelujah. When the smoke clears and the dust settles, I only got two things. I got a promise. Lo, I'll be with you. Always. Even unto the end of the world. Can anybody say amen for the promise? I got a promise. I'll be with you. Always. Even unto the end of the world. But if I can't remember the promise, David, I got a name. At that name, every knee shall bow. At that name, every tongue shall confess. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? I'm not talking about Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. I'm not talking about Nehemiah, Jeremiah, or Hagar. I'm not talking about Matthew, Luke, James, or John. But I'm talking about that name that is above every name. There's power in that name. There's salvation in that name. There's sanctification in that name. There's justification in that name. I know it's Sunday morning or Sunday night, but can I get the fire? Of a Sunday morning. On a Sunday night. Do I have your permission. To call that name. I know some of y'all too sadistic. Some of y'all too sophisticated. Some of y'all too middle class. But I need about five or six folk. Who don't mind stepping out in the aisle. Strutting your stuff. And telling somebody. There's joy. In that name. There's hope in that name. There's healing in that name. There's deliverance in that name. Okay, nobody in here has ever been saved. Nobody in here has ever been helped. Nobody in here has ever been healed. Nobody in here has ever been delivered. But if he saved you, if he helped you, if he healed you, if he delivered you, you ought to give him glory. Because of his name, you ought to shout because of his name. May I call 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 his name. Yeah. Wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Rose of Sharon. Lily of the Valley bright and morning star shake somebody's hand like you're going to shake it off tell somebody I may not have a lot of money I may not have a political name but I've got a promise and I've got a name he walks with me talks with me tell somebody I'm willing to make a shift I'm willing to take a risk because I've seen the lightning flash and I've heard I said I've heard I've heard the thunder roll I've felt sin breakers dashing trying to conquer my soul but I love that conjunction I heard am I the only one I heard the voice of Jesus telling me still to fight on. He promised, he promised, he promised never, never to leave me alone. Shout, I'm ready.